Bingo, we're back to Think Tech. Uh, it's the one o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Welcome to Research in Manoa. Our show today is called Earthquake Early Warning and Tsunami Prediction. Our guest for the show is James Foster of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you, James. Pleasure to be here. So we're going to take a look at the low-cost networks for earthquakes uh, and early warning and tsunami prediction. The mass production of uh, smartphones can be integrated with GPS uh, and uh, accelerometers in revolutionizing fields that can take advantage of these low-cost sensors. So James is collaborating with USGS to build an early earthquake warning network in Chile. Let's hear more about that. Um, this is a, a revolutionary um, ability that has developed, as you said, through the development of um, earthquake, um, of, sorry, of um, cell phones. And the fact that these are being built now in millions and millions of Everybody of millions. in the world. Yeah. Everybody in the world has them. Everybody wants increasing little gadgets that uh, can be integrated into the cell phones and that can allow them to do new and you know, useful things. And it, it turns out that some of these gadgets that are being now built into uh, cell phones can be used to do science and hazard mitigation. Oh, sure. And two of the key ones are the accelerometers. So, you know, everybody knows that you turn your cell phone and you, you know, the screen turns with you. Yeah. And, and so the cell phone has in it an accelerometer to be able to recognize what you're doing with the cell phone at any given time. And those accelerometers are actually sensitive enough to detect earthquakes. Just because my phone feels an, ac an acceleration, a movement, is that enough? Or are you talking about collecting signals for lots, from lots of cell phones? Well, initially, it would be our, our concept is using a, a fairly dense network, but it's not everybody's network, You're not everybody's cell phone. Um, it, it could be. And, and there's movements afoot to see if we can develop an app that anybody who wants to can download, install on their phone, and become an active part of a, a, a mobile network. evolving network for, wow, for earthquake early warning. Brilliant. So, so if I have a city, for example, and I have, uh, say, a million people uh, mm. living in the city, uh, then I can, I can en enlist, say, you know, 100,000 of them to be part of my network, and they will opt in, and their, their cell phones will have a, a, an app that feels the vibration and sends vibration to a central place and the central place maybe with a geophysicist present will say uh oh we're having having an earthquake so you're not talking about sensors in the ocean you're not talking about uh, satellite sensors or all the new kind of fang newfangled technology that's all over the pacific now or that hopefully is being installed all over the you're talking about the cell phones right there in the city which is being affected by the earthquake. That's, that's the concept. And you know, there's a little way to go before that can be you know, put into an operational setting. Um, and the first step is the network that we're developing right now in Chile, where we're actually using a commercial smartphone. We're uh, taking advantage of its onboard accelerometer. Um, and we're taking advantage of GPS capability. Right now, we actually have attached an external GPS unit, but there's a new generation of cell phones and firmware, the Android operating system that would give us the capability to run all of that internally on the cell phone. And what's, what's particularly uh, cute about this whole concept is that normally when we do a field deployment, the, the biggest problem is communications. You know, how do we get our field data back out <laughs> of the field? Cell phone already has it. <laughs> cell phone already has it. So, and, and not only that, but the cell phone has computing capability on board. So we can even do um, onboard computing, we can filter the data, we can do some preliminary processing to improve the robustness of the signal, to uh, make sure that we've got nice, clean, compact data that we send back to our, uh, our central um, server and the, uh, the facility. That so once you download the app, this happens in the background. You don't necessarily see it happening? That's, so yes, so for this crowdsourced um, concept, that would happen in the background. Um, you know, right now, the ones we're installing, they're in a box. They get put onto um, buildings in Chile. Um, we've been working with some of the military installations oh. because they've got security. You mean so it's not, it's not uh, deployed to an individual? It's not it's deployed to an individual. It's hung on a wall somewhere. Exactly. So we've actually fixed these on roofs, on posts, 
anywhere that's relatively fixed, that's got a good sky view so that the GPS is operating well and so that the, the cell phone has good communications. Um, but what about, what about me? I'm walking around the street, I have mm -hmm. it in my pocket, you know, I use it all day, I make yeah. telephone calls. This app would help, I mean, would help you through me also, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Um, so, as I said, we're not there yet because the problems of dealing with 100,000 people who are doing things that are going to cause shaking, you know, they're getting on and off of buses, they're going up and down elevators, you know, they're doing all sorts of it's things. Patterns. So you'd need some pretty sophisticated cloud-based computing behind the, uh, the crowd-sourced version of this to, to recognize what's just a person doing day-to-day -day things and what's you know, 100,000 people all suddenly starting to shake in the same sort of way because an earthquake is... Uh, so really what, what I hear you saying is that th there would be a kind of a filter on this phone and it would say, oh, this is the sound of a bus or he's driving in a car, it's not the same thing. We're looking for a footprint you know, of, a, of an earthquake and it's different and we, we, we can filter out all the other sounds and vibrations and just send you, you, the geophysicist in the central location, will send you, in fact, the central location could be anywhere, couldn't it? Yeah. That's, it could that's be here. here. Yeah. There could like. be many of them. So, yeah. So yes, think tech could be a <laughs> central location. <laughs> But no, that's exactly right. There, there has to be some serious computing that recognizes that, you know, not just one phone is showing kind of characteristic shaking, but all of the phones in that vicinity are showing that same shaking. So, you know, that can't operate within the app. That has to be controlled through some central facility that recognizes that all of these phones are sending data in at yeah. the same time that show the same. And, and the GPS thing is going to give you a, a, essentially a map, uh, a map. Uh, you have a map, you know where it's coming from, so you can see it, um, you know, uh, you can see all the lights lighting up on, on the map. Now, will you be able to triangulate and determine the epicenter of the earthquake? Exactly. So that's, that's, that's the, you know, the, the whole point of the partly, you know, the earthquake early warning, but then taking the earthquake early warning and mapping that over to tsunami prediction. So, so the earthquake early warning is really, it's just about detecting shaking and saying, hey, there's some serious shaking, damaging shaking coming your way. You know, here's a few seconds of warning ahead of that shaking reaching you that you've got time then to, to do something. You can crawl under the table. Um, you know, you can, if you're a surgeon in, uh, in a hospital operating room, you know, you can withdraw your instrument from the... Close up. <laughs> and close up from the patient that's uh, lying on the table in front of you. Um, if you're a power station, you can spin down your generator. All of these things that, you know, a few seconds of warning before that damaging shaking hits could be critical to maintaining critical infrastructure or lives um, in the event of heavy shaking. That's, um, and that's the other part of this, that, that it's a two-way street. One is you send your vibration information data to whoever is uh, analyzing it. But the other, the other part is somebody at the other end saying, hmm, we have a problem here. Uh, you know, Houston, <laughs> we have a problem. So we're going to advise everybody in the network, okay, maybe every, in fact, the, the people who opt in mm -hmm. uh, to send you data is only a subset. When you go back to say, whoops, you better get under the table, you want to go wider than just your special agents. You want to tell everybody, right? Oh, absolutely. You, you need to be plugged right in. You know, for the general public, you're going to have to go through some warning system like you know, Hawaii's so how do you know, tsunami do that? warning. So That's not necessarily the same app, because that would go to people who have not opted in, not necessarily right. opted in. No, that's, that's going to go to a, a broad public warning system. Uh, those are operated by every county, has its own emergency um, I see. You know, response system. I see. But then very specialized things like the hospitals, like the, um, you know, the power companies, they may you know, have a very specific warning that they need that you know, plugs straight into some emergency response software that starts things happening that you don't want it to go to a designated person who then has to run to hit that red button. You know, there's, there's no time for that. You yeah, actually have yeah. to have stuff that starts to happen automatically. So you have to be robust. You don't want to be <laughs> shutting down the city's power grid. Um, you know, on a false, false alarm it's a, situation. It's a, it's a voice message, though, that comes back. Um, it, says, it, could, it could be almost anything. You know, it could be something that automatically gets interpreted by some governing software and that, that says, hey, you know, we've got to shut things down right now. And, you know, there's no time for somebody to be sitting in the middle of this and hearing the message and responding because the, the warning could be really one, two seconds. You know, that there's no time for some of these for human 
uh, intermediary for the for the messaging system. So th that isn't so the messaging system is not necessarily part of what you're working on. No, and that you know, I'm a geophysicist. I'm a researcher. You know, my problem is not how best to get these messages into the public, into those stakeholders that need to be able to respond. That's the the role of people whose jobs, you know, sure. in emergency management. Mm -hmm. But you have to communicate, um, you know, to the, say, the city city warning system. Um, uh, is it just a, you know, like digital, where you say there's a problem or there isn't a problem? Or do you talk about the, you know, intensity of the problem? Or uh, talk about what kind of advice should be given um, by that city warning system? It's a very subtle problem, actually. It, exactly what the warning should be so yeah. that people respond in the right way to that warning. Um, yeah. You have to be very, very careful about the language you use um, so that people really understand in that second that they have to ingest the data exactly what their response should be. So it's a many-fold problem. Um, you know, we as a geophysicist, as a researcher within the Institute, we're working to be able to provide the emergency management people with the best information that they have and we'll work with them so that they understand what it is we're giving them and they understand then what they want to broadcast out to the public but but yeah you have to be very very careful you can't just say you know there's Run damage the and hill, shaking coming you, have, you get you know. panic and all this right so and so there has to be an educational program that educates the public so that they know in advance you know they don't just get this warning and it's like you know, what's this what, what, what am i going to do you yeah. know they, they have to know through um school education programs, through radio programs, you know, through any sort of media that gets reaches out to the public that this sort of thing's happening. So, so the mainland has these um, shake alert programs that they involve schools, they involve the public, and they go through these dry runs of how do you respond if the sirens go off? You know, and what, and what, what do you, do you say? Do? Yeah. And, and what exactly? Do you tell yeah. them to get under the desk? you tell them to take their instruments out? <laughs> what do you tell them? Well, and you tell them in voice, no, because you have the ability to do that on a cell phone. You do, um, but you don't have the time to give a complicated message. Right. So you really just have to give them a very short cue that, you know, this is time for you to respond in the way that you have been trained to respond. Um, so, you know, there's no time so for complicated instructions. So pre-training is what pre -training helps is absolutely them do this. Crucial. So yeah, you have something you mentioned both before the show and a moment ago that uh, concerns me is that you don't have a lot of time here. We're talking about real time. We're talking about, you, you know, you, the vibrations happen in a number of phones. The, the, the process uh, to analyze those vibrations is almost immediate. Mm -hmm. and, and the message goes out, whoops, you got an earthquake here. And, and you said it's only a matter of seconds. How much time is it really? I mean, the, um, uh, how much time is it really? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's interesting. Our understanding of exactly how much lead time you might have is, is sort of evolving as you know the science evolves. Um, a lot of the, the work on the mainland is based on the assumption that the, the sh damaging shaking comes with surface waves from the, the seismic, from the earthquake, and and they propagate relatively slowly. Um, and so some of the design of the system is based on the fact that you might have twenty seconds, thirty seconds. Wow. Um, so you might you actually can't have do quite much a lot. in that period. You can't do very much. Um, it, it's looking like you know, depending on how you design your system, you know, the practical systems we can design right now, you, you may not even really have more than one or two seconds. Can, can, can I save myself in one or two seconds Ab or 20 Absolutely. Seconds? There, there are crucial things that you can do as an individual to, to you know, reduce the risk of you being hurt or, you know, or killed in you know, damaging shape. What are they? Um, <coughs> getting under the table. Getting under the table. You know, you, you're looking to be in a place where if things are starting to fall, you're protected from at least the worst of that. So, you know, you're getting into a structural safe. You know, if you've got time, you can get out of the building into open, clear space. That's the best thing. Get out, get out to the but, street. You know, otherwise, if you don't, you know, just get under the table. You know, get under something that's going to provide you some, um, some protection from things falling off of the roof. Uh, yeah. Because that, those are the things that really... Well, happen. speaking of time, James, uh, we're going to take a short break now. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Bill Sharp, your host of Asia Review. Watch us every week, every Monday afternoon for exciting, up-to-date information and analysis about contemporary affairs in Asia. Aloha Kako, I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options and we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward. 
And this show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper to bumper traffic. And this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon and let's move Hawaii forward. Bingo, and nothing untoward has happened in this last minute either, but it could have. And we would have had you know, a, the luxury of a minute to save ourselves you know, given the time frame you've been talking about. This is James Foster of HIGP. He's been working on a system for Chile, uh, you know, which will identify vibrations that suggest an earthquake and then allow uh, municipal authorities to warn people to get safe. So interesting. But I'm talking about, you know, you're a geophysicist. Um, you know, we don't usually see a ge geophysicist getting involved in, in, in this kind of electronic system that would give warnings to people and save a community. Uh, how'd you get involved in this? It's been a slow evolution. Um, I, as you say, I, I did a degree in geophysics and most of the, the, the opportunities for employment are within the oil or you know, mining fields for geophysicists generally. Um, I was interested in volcanoes. I came to Hawaii to, to look at the volcanoes. <laughs> um, but you know, initially I was interested more from a, a scientific intellectual point of view. You know, how do volcanoes work? And you know that the application is so that we can understand them better and so that we, you know, we can warn people in advance of things that we understand now might be about to happen. Um, but I did a PhD here in Hawaii. I've stayed in Hawaii. Um, my interests have broadened beyond volcanoes. I look at things going on in the atmosphere, tsunamis on the ocean. And, and, you know, you're looking for a role. Okay, what is it? I do geophysics. And, you know, you want it to be more than just a dry intellectual exercise, um, which is very fulfilling. Um, but, you know, it's sort of isolating from the broader community that we, we work within. And so, you know, as my career has evolved and I've realized the, the various ways in which the things that I do can be put to very direct, concrete, um, purpose to you know, provide additional information, help, and uh, particularly you know, working with hazard mitigation for communities. And Hawaii's exposed to a lot of hazards. We've got the volcanoes, we've got earthquakes, we've got hurricanes, we've got tsunamis. You know, we're, sort of, we're, we're, we're sort of a bullseye in the middle. Microcosm of anything you'd ever <laughs> want to know about That's right. geophysics. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating place to work intellectually, but it's also a place where you realize that the work I'm doing has concrete, direct um, application to helping you know, our society. And so I've but evolved. Is it true that what, as a geophysicist, mm -hmm. when you walk down the street, you have a different perception of the world around you. In other words, you, as your feet touch the pavement, you, they, they're looking for vibrations. You feel that you're on top <laughs> of an earth which is always changing and moving. No, it, it's true. You know, as a geophysicist, as a geologist, you know, we, we look at the earth you know, from this very long-term, large-scale process sort of uh, perspective, as well as you know, from earthquakes, which is very short time scales, but, you know, driven by these big sort of global scale processes. And you know, I work with sea level change. I, I, I work with the tsunamis. And so, yeah, you look at the ocean, you look at the way it changes, and you think about, you know, what's happening if the land here might be subsiding a little bit. You know, that's making sea level worse. And you look around for clues about that might be happening. and. Yeah, you, it's... Um, and, and you think in, you know, 10,000 year bites, except what we're talking about today is like 10 second bites. Yeah, it's, so we, we span this huge range of time scales and this large range of spatial scales as well of, you know, the various different processes yeah. that are involved in the things that we, we study. It's so, so, okay, so it, it occurs to you as a geophysicist um, who, you know, appreciates, um, you know, earthquakes, um, that we ought, to, we ought to do something about this warning system. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm, I'm really talking about the, the connection now, the outreach from HIGP and science and your work there um, to the community, not mm -hmm. only in here, uh, of course, that's interesting, and I do want to cover that, but in Chile. Mm -hmm. how, how does that happen? Did you wake up one morning and say, hmm, Chile, that's what I want to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, things evolve in science, particularly in a research angle, you know, often very organically. You know, we don't start with a concrete plan that we need to address this very specific problem in this very specific area. So 
as a research group, I work within the GPS group, the Pacific GPS facility within HIGP. And um, that group and the, the various different uh, leaders of the group, um, whose mantle I know hold, um, have a long history since the early 90s of working in Chile. Um, so we've got a long, you know, we've got connections with the researchers in Chile, the institutions in Chile that deal with this problem within Chile. So, um, you know, as we develop new technologies and we realize, wow, this is a really exciting technology that has real application in this very specific field, we look around, it's like, okay, so where would we, where could we deploy this? It's like, well, you know, we have these connections in Chile, you know, they've got a very serious problem, you know, many of the, um, the tsunamis that have impacted Hawaii have come from Chile and they, mm. they have very, very large earthquakes very regularly and so it's it's a real real problem that they're struggling to uh, to find the best solutions to and so um, so Chile was partly because they have a very concrete problem that they haven't yet managed to fully address and we have the connection concrete problem that's kind of a double entendre <laughs> <laughs> it, it is um, they actually you know they've addressed the, uh, the the construction part of the the problem and, th and that's one of the, the biggest um, perhaps the biggest areas that impacts the um, the impact of earthquakes in, in regions is making sure that you build things properly so that they can sustain these things and, mm -hmm. and Chile's done a great job of that mm -hmm. and so part of what they're looking for now is to get better um, local tsunami warnings um, they want to know whether that big earthquake they had has generated a you know a potentially dangerous tsunami and they need to know that very quickly because you know, it's, it's, it's a near field problem um, and then, of course, the shaking, you know, can they, you know, improve the ability of their population to, to get into safe places um, quickly enough to, to save lives. And they're a, perfect, they're a perfect laboratory for this because perfect. they have so many earthquakes and tsunamis. And exactly. You know, they're right on this subduction zone that runs down pretty much their entire coastline, and they've got a very, very long coastline. Um, and so they have big magnitude 8, 9, you know, 8, and occasionally magnitude 9 earthquakes. Uh, so um, it's a... It's a real problem for that country, and there's great laboratory. So it was organic in the sense that somebody knew somebody in Chile, in the uh, scientific establishment in Chile, mm -hmm. and said, hmm, why don't we try this in Chile? Because they need it, and we here in Hawaii, we understand it, and we can bring the elements together to actually deliver a system to Chile. Well, yeah, I mean, and I should make clear that actually the USGS has led this particular portion of this effort. You know, they, Does that mean with money? Um, they acquired the grant that provided the money to support this. And so the leader of that effort, uh, Dr. Bren, ben Brooks, was actually the director of the GPS facility here in HIGP ah, before I took over. So, yeah. so this, you know, this, again, it's just this organic element. You know, he, the seeds of this particular idea were s sown here in Hawaii uh, between a conversation that he had with me and with Gerard Fryer, who's until recently at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. And Gerard was asking about the capability of low cost um, tsunami, uh, low cost GPS chips to help with tsunami warning and we weren't sure that we could conceive of that particular element but we thought well you know actually for an earthquake problem you know there's a potential for, for GPS and it's so not only really low cost it might be better it might actually be better um, and this is this gets to one of the the elements that it's sort of a bit of a, a sideways step for people in the research community which is that Quality is not necessarily better than quantity. You know, we, we like to think in research, you know, we just want to get the most accurate measurements we possibly can, and that's going to tell us you know, everything, or at least the most we can, we, can, uh, we can get out of our observations. But for a very applied problem like earthquake early warning, what's better is to have a lot of sensors covering the entire area that uh, you're concerned about. And you can, you can compromise a little bit on the actual quality of those measurements. And this is where, you know, this is the realization that, uh, you know, Ben had uh, and that led to this whole um, concept for the, this network in Chile is that, wow, you know, we don't have to spend $20,000 on putting in these you know, high quality research sensors, which means we can only put in a few. We can spend $350 on a cell phone and a little solar panel to power it, and we can put out hundreds. And, and that's actually going to be a better solution to this very specific problem. It, it won't tell us some of the answers to the research questions, but it, it's going to well, give us practically save lives and all that. Absolutely. So it's an electronic play, though. You, I mean, of course, of course, HIGP is well, you know, well skilled in building the database mm -hmm. and making the you know uh, ge ge geographical analysis over um, you know a map mm -hmm. 
But to get that signal, to get that data, you have to have the app and you have to have a system to accumulate the information mm -hmm. through a server, I guess, somewhere sure. to pull all that in. Right. Um, is HIGP able to? Is it involved in doing the electronics on this? Um, the, the fundamental electronics, no, but the, that software element we're actually working to have in-house capability. So wonderful, right, right, wonderful. right now, that warning portion of the system is, is handled elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's, that's the capability that, as you say, we, we have the capability to do that. We've not yet uh, installed and, and got it running. But there's a, you know, there's a robustness in having several places doing that simultaneously. Um, sure. So uh, we're going to be doing that, um, and we need to have that because you know the concept is that this isn't just related, you know, restricted to Chile. There are other countries that could benefit from this sort of network, and yeah. we want to be able to reach out to those and offer you know, a full, comprehensive uh, solution to the problem that they are struggling well, with. A footnote to what what you said: I, it's it's worth mentioning. I think that my experience, my observation, that scientists. Um, sometimes find that they need to do something in another discipline in order to get their job done. And of course, uh, you know, they can reach out and, and uh, you know, uh, collaborate with other elements in a network, but they can also, and I've seen it happen many times at UH, in SOWEST, in HIGP, where they can learn that stuff and do it on their own and good for them. That's, you know, that's the kind of grit that you need <laughs> to do science and get the job done, yeah? No, you're absolutely right. You know, as a researcher, you're constantly reinventing yourself. You know, you're finding that, you know, the skills, the tools you have to hand are actually great for this other problem that you'd never even thought about. And you're right, you know, you can address that by just bringing in a specialist in that field, or you bootstrap your own expertise and <laughs> you just go ahead and do it. And you, you still need, you know, the help of other people. You know, yeah. you, you rarely do things on your own. You know, you need lots of different uh, skill sets that you can't possibly hope to develop all by yourself, but, um, but yeah. There must a be a lot of gratification in that, reinvention of gratification. <laughs> That's absolutely right. So uh, one, more, one more minute before we have to go, but uh, my last question to you was, what's going to happen now? What's the timeline like to get this in place in Chile? The network's in. The network's running in a, you know, we haven't got the full, where the plan is to put 200 stations out. Uh, right now, I think we have almost 60 in the ground and running, um, and so we're doing detections of earthquakes. We've detected four earthquakes to date with the network. None of them have been damaging, um, uh, but they've been relatively small. And so, you know, they're demonstrating that we can actually detect earthquakes that are smaller than the ones we were concerned about, um, which is a great, you know, demonstration of the, yeah. the network's capability. Yeah. So um, we'll hope to have the full network rolled out, you know, by the end of this year. Um, we'll be building our in-house capability to, to bring all the data in and, you know, do the analysis. Uh, and our in-house goal is to be able to translate not just the earthquake early warning, but to connect that to tsunami prediction. So we'll be looking to see whether the earthquake has actually moved the seafloor enough that there needs to be a warning of a, of a tsunami uh, threat to the local communities. It's a new world, isn't it? It, it is. changes everything. It, <laughs> it actually, I, I believe it will. Um, and, you know, it opens up, you know, all sorts of avenues for countries that couldn't afford these really expensive networks to be able to implement um, these life-saving uh, infrastructure uh, saving uh, networks and uh, yeah I think it's going to transform things. Good for you James. Really you're saving lives, doing the right thing, taking so. science to humanity. That's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. Hello.